Hi, Ted. Hello, James. How are you? Good, good, good. Happy almost Easter, man. There you go. <laughs> I appreciate Thanks. you having me on. I'm loving to do this, I tell you. Oh, well, it's a uh, privilege is all mine. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm glad you have the interest, man. That really, it, it, it's, it's not like the film was released yesterday, you know. <laughs> you, you know, it's it's funny. Um, it, it almost feels like it was. You know what? I get that almost every day from people literally all over the world. I get things sent to me just two days ago. I got a, a thing sent to me. It was one of the most beautiful artistic renditions of my face is that character and the guy does it with a ballpoint pen colors all different colors and it's just you go oh how do they do it i just sweetheart would you mind getting the uh, photograph from, from uh, upstairs and okay uh, i'll show you one of those but this one just blew me away that it was done with a ballpoint pen and it's done with passion i bet right? oh my god it just unbelievable literally unbelievable I, I and you know and this is a fourth generation person that has seen it and he's in his early 20s and he wanted me to say he said happy easter mr neely you know <laughs> it, it's absolutely insane i no matter where we've been and you know in all those years we've been pretty much everywhere and i don't know if, if you're aware but i've been so fortunate um well, I can say this in the interview if you want, or do I? No, you go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I am so overwhelmed by the positivity of what you just said. You know, it feels like it was released yesterday. You know, uh, I was invited to Rome to join in their production of celebrating their 20th anniversary of doing this film every Easter and every Christmas for 20 years. And uh, they said, we will need you for a four week rehearsal and a six week run. And I'm thinking, what? I'm not gonna go to Rome for, for 10 <laughs> weeks. Who, who gets to do that, you know? So we went and guess how long that tour lasted instead of six weeks? Um, I don't know, six months, something like that? Five and a half years. We went over there in 2014. We would still be there now. I believe it. Been all over Italy, Spain, Germany, the Netherlands, it, and it's standing room only everywhere we go. Right. We've played 10,000 seat arenas in those and they're packed. It, you go, how is this possible? It's, it's, we're gonna celebrate the 50th anniversary not too soon, not too far from now, which is the 48th anniversary yeah. in yeah. August, you know? And they're coming like it just came out yesterday. Well, there is something, I, you know, there's something obviously enduring about it. I mean, I, it's been around almost my entire life, uh, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I actually call this uh, series I'm doing called, it's called Coincidental Conversations. Beautiful, beautiful. Because nice. wow. I, I'm a big believer in, you know, there is no such thing as coincidence. <laughs> um, you know, and I, you know, like, I'm sure you've heard it a trillion times. I grew up with this film. There was something that always drew me to the film, even as a child, you know, and it, and what the centerpiece of that was always Gethsemane, uh, you know, yes. and when you were on that mountaintop, there was something about it that even as a child, it was hitting something in me. And then in, uh, in high school, I'm a musician. So I know you started as a drummer. Yeah. In high school, you know, really fell in love with the Brown album, and we we actually played Battle of the Bands, and our the name of our band was Pontius Pilot. Ah, that's great. <laughs> we started the set with Thirty Nine Lashes on guitar, uh -huh. and um, and then in in ninety four, my wife for my birthday took me to the Merrillville to Star Plaza Theater in Merrillville, Indiana. Yeah. Where oh my <laughs> oh my god. Oh man, that is magnificent. There's Norman over there, my goodness, and the tickets yeah. and Carl. Oh. Oh. 
you know. Oh, and the camel up on the hill too. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so yeah. I've kept this obviously ever since. And after the after the show, I went. We went around the side, and I got a chance to meet you. And I asked you one question. I asked you what it was like to do get set in me every night. And you said it's a journey. Uh -huh. And it is. so that's it what is. I wanted to talk about with you, you know, about the documentary today. Is well, just let me let you know that it's impossible for me to tell the short story. Oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. I, that's okay. So anytime during this, if, if I'm going over time or something, you feel free to jump in and start some other conversation. So. Because yeah. I can talk about this forever and never scratch the surface, all of it. And Gethsemane, oh my God, talk about it, Jim. You're talking to somebody who could also talk about it forever, so we might be on for a few days. I have no problem with that. <laughs> and, and we're both musicians. You're yeah. you started as a drummer, right? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. you're still you're a rock and roller at heart, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. My band was when you know when we first started in in, in junior high school in my yeah. hometown. We were doing everybody else's music and we did everything we possibly could to sound exactly like the original record because we yeah. didn't write songs. We didn't have a clue about that, you know, and that's what apparently turned into the fan base for the band. Even when we got out to California and we're doing things in Hollywood, they came to see this crazy band from Texas. It sounded like everybody else, you know. <laughs> did you guys do original songs at any point? We or? didn't write. We just, oh, it, you okay. know, we, we just never thought about that because we yeah. were so we were so in love with all the songs that were on the radio all the time, you know. Oh, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> she loves you. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in the band could sing as well. So I didn't have to do all the singing. It was just incredible. Oh. In fact, last night, uh, late in the evening last night, I got a, a text from a fan who, <laughs> it was a verbal text. And all it was, was they were listening to uh, some recordings of our band when we were doing our stuff live in California and all that. And it was during when we were doing a, see me, feel me. Yeah. Touch me, oh, nice. and they got to that listening to you at the end, you know, and all of the harmonies in there, and, the, and all of a sudden, I heard the guy say, "You guys sound great," you know. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, that's something you don't hear anymore. Is really is really good harmonies. No, you know, no, yeah, and then boy, do I miss it. Oh. Well, you know, I, I got to just say this candidly: you still have the voice. Thank well, you. I was watching. It worked. Um, you know, in preparation for this, I went and watched, uh, I think, a 2017 show, and I was watching Get Set of Me. Huh. And when that note, and I'm like, okay, well, like most musicians, as they age, I'm, I'm interested in how he has, what has he done with his, his range? And you hit the note. Huh. So how is, I mean, that to me is pretty astounding that you... Well you what you just said that, that i still had the range yeah that's because i came from ranger texas <laughs> and, <laughs> and you got the humor still i can't help it man <laughs> your wife is very lucky ah, it, and, I, and no one is more amazed than i that i can still hit those notes you know at my age of course i'm 33 still you know i, I, I know uh, that at, at my age you'd figure it'd be gone most people can't do it but oh Thank you so very much. You know, I was uh, going to say, do you ever do you ever get the feeling like you're getting a little help from oh, no question. all this? No question. I, and I've I've felt that since the first time I went on stage on Broadway in '71, mm. literally. Because you know, when you're doing eight shows a week, you think, well, it's, hey, they're you know they're only on for a couple hours a night. But you know, you're going full out in when you're doing a live Broadway show or any show you're doing. You don't, you know, you don't play with, you know, you go after it, you know, so, yeah. so the bottom line is there were so many times when I would be doing lots of energy interviews before the shows and, and talking is the worst thing for your voice in terms of singing, second only to cold, dry wind hitting your, your vocal cords, you know, so there were times when I thought, oh, God, I hope tonight, I hope I can hit them. Never have I had an opportunity where it didn't work. So yes, I'm getting help all the time. In fact, here's my newest helper right here. Who, who is that? 
<laughs> this is Benji. Benji. <laughs> yeah, and he's he's only seven months old. Oh my gosh! Well, we just got cute. him recently, and oh uh, he's just he's the awesome. sweetest little guy in the world. My God, oh my. He, he's he's so smart. My wife teaches him tricks all the time now. <laughs> He just, and now that he's gotten comfortable with the house, he runs up and down the stairs with us and chases us around the rooms. He's just a great little guy, this Benji. <laughs> he's got a lot of energy. Oh, he's it's incredible. Yeah. Well, go play, buddy. Go. So, he may jump up here anytime. Oh, yeah. Hey, bring him on. Um, <laughs> that's the other word is energy. Oh, yeah. With you, with you, you know, when I met you for that brief moment, I'm sure you get this from a lot of people. I was like, well, what is it going to be like to talk to somebody who has played Jesus for so long? You know, has, <laughs> it, has it transformed him? And when I talked to you for a brief moment, I felt presence. Like you were with me. Yeah. You know, and I felt an energy. Do you, did, did you always have that? Has the role brought that out in you? What, you know, what transformation, if any? Well, I can honestly say that when you mentioned you refer to the role into the film and all that, that what it has brought out of me and given me an entirely new life, literally, uh, it's, it's been amazing because growing up in a town as small as my hometown, we have 1,989 people in the entire city counting cats, dogs and horses and goats and all that, you know, and uh, the bottom line was that it was as if it was just one large family. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody was patient and kind and friendly. It just you couldn't walk down any street anywhere without saying hello to a friend, you know, by and calling them by their first name. Yeah. So, so that was such a magnificent experience to have to be surrounded constantly by all of those really wonderful, generous, kind people. And then whenever we put the band together and started playing, you know, for little private events and stuff. Ha, we were always where the, where the fun was going on. They always had us there to play, you know? And it was amazing because we had no idea. And it was great that we were the only band in town. So we got to be at all the functions that happened, you know? <laughs> so I have been taught by my family, you know, the, at the importance of being personal with people mm -hmm. being friendly and open and not judgmental, you know, open to anything. And thank goodness I felt that naturally whenever we started working on the, the shows, when we did it in New York and then when we did the in American national tours and then going to this <laughs> European experience. And, and I'm a person who loves close contact with people. Uh, did I, did I hug the breath out of you when we met? Okay. See, I, I, lo I love those hugs. Yeah. I just, and in, in Europe, they call them Ted hugs, you know, <laughs> and I haven't had one now for over a year and I miss it so much, you know, and, it's, and it's amazing. What, what is it about that touch? Cause I noticed in the documentary, I'm not going to give too much of away. I noticed in the documentary when you were doing the reunion in New York with Norman. Yes. Your hand was on his shoulder. Yes. Constantly. What yes. is it about that touch for you that? Well, it, again, it's back to my family. Uh, mm -hmm. My family was extremely affectionate. Everybody in our family and most of the people in my hometown were the same way. Well, it was uh, like I said, it was if we were one large family and we embraced each other every time we saw each other. It's just something. Oh, Good to see you. Wow, it's nice. And it, you never want to pull away from it because I can feel that wonderful energy coming from, from the person and especially Norman Jewison. Ah, talk about an example of human being who is so generous and kind to everybody. He cast an entire company of unknowns. He could have well, when I first met with the man, he, he told me Im immediately, I've already cast all of my principles for the film. I'm just here in L.A. casting dancers and, and chorus members, you know, and uh, so I don't have anything for you to do. Uh, he says, I'd like the way you look. And, and he and I sat for an hour the first time we sat down in a restaurant talking, just having conversations, you know. Yeah. It, it was as, as if he and I had been lifetime friends. Just it was just wonderful and he treated all of us while we were on the film set as if we were contemporaries and we knew nothing about that form 
in the documentary, it, it talks about you uh, showing up with a beard or, you know, <laughs> but he has a line in there where he says what he cared most about were your eyes. Yeah. What you really he, watched it, didn't you? <laughs> what did he mean by that? I think I know what he meant, but what did he mean, do you think? Well, I can, I can tell you from the experience of the meeting, just so you know in general, I was in L.A. rehearsing for the first live performance of Tommy in the theater production to play Tommy the character. And I it were rehearsing before the show opened, you know, and when you're doing that rehearsal stuff, you rehearsal every day from eight, nine in the morning, sometimes till midnight, but then sometimes we do a show to see how it's going and the audience comes in. So I read in the Hollywood Reporter that Norman Jewison is in Hollywood uh, casting for his film, Jesus Christ Superstar. And I went, oh, oh, oh. oh you okay? So I'm thinking, ah, this is great, but, in rehearsal, you can't get out of rehearsal to go do something else because you got to be there all the time. And I'm thinking, I got to see this man. And with all honesty, I wasn't even thinking about maybe being cast in his film. I wanted to meet him because I'm such a big fan of his work. And I thought, well, maybe the next film he does, he'll have a, a, a role for a short, skinny Texan where he'll do, do some goofy things, you know? <laughs> and so I thought, and I didn't have an agent or a manager. And I thought, I, I got to get a hold of this man. And I was a Boy Scout as a child. And the, 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 right, yeah. the word that we remember as a Boy Scout is be prepared. That's, mm -hmm. that's the slogan. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm anxious. Hey, how do I prepare for this? So I thought, oh, Director's Guild. So I called the Director's Guild. Do you have an agent representative number for Norman Jewison? Oh, yes. Just a minute, sir. Came, gave it to me. It was the William Morris Agency. I got on the phone, I called the William Morris Agency. Hello, I said, um, can you connect me please with Mr. Jewison's agent? Yes, hold on just a minute, boom, bing. Two minutes later, hello. And I said, are you Norman Jewison's agent? He said, yes, who are you? I said, well, you wouldn't know me from Adam. I, I'm here in LA as an actor and we're rehearsing for Tommy. He said, oh, I've heard about that. I hear it's a pretty good show, you know, yeah. I said, well, I'd like to ask you a favor, sir. Okay, what? Would you mind calling Norman and asking him if he would come to see our show and let that be my audition? There was silence for a moment. And he said, who are you? I said, my name's Ted Neely. Nobody knows me. I'm just here working and I want to meet this man because I'm his biggest fan as a film producer director. He said, well, hang on a minute. Okay. I'm assuming he's going to hang up on me, you see. <laughs> Two minutes later, he came back. I just talked to Norman. He said he'd love to come see that show. He's heard about it. He'd like to give it a shot. When would you like him to come? And I said, anytime he wants, but don't let me know he's in the audience because then I'll be all petrified and I won't forget, I'll forget my words and I'll make a fool of myself. He said, okay, no problem. So we rehearsed the show, finally it opens. We go in, we're doing it and it's getting great response. And we did matinees on, on Saturdays and Sundays and then evening performances on both. And on, on the Saturday matinee, uh, I was injured, knocked out cold on stage. And the reason that happened was they made the stage look like a pinball machine. And it had levels, different levels, you see, up and down stairs and all that. Well, uh, are you really familiar with the, the, the Who's uh, album of Tommy? Where it has the overture in the beginning, just instrumental overture. Okay. Well, Pete Townsend wrote an under tour for the end of the first act see okay. it's, it's instrumental all right yeah. well that, that instrumental turned out to be a great choreographic thing for the for the show but and they wanted me in it but i don't dance you see so guess what they had me do so i could be in that under tour as tommy the lead character what made me the pinball <laughs> we had four male dancers in the show and two understudies guys who looked like arnold schwarzenegger they were just muscle-bound gorilla and they were ballet dancers as well you see so those dancers those four dancers were tossing me back and forth while the dancers are doing all the choreography in the under tour you see it was so great for me to be tossed in the air like a little child over here and over there because they were gorillas they could toss anybody you know 
Well, that matinee, one of those guerrilla guys was out. In his understudy, another guerrilla guy was on. So there's the four, four of them. And the, the understudy and I both misjudged one of the catches and we hit the floor and both were knocked out cold on stage. Now, the choreo choreography for that was great. And the dancers were so talented, they made it look like that was part of the choreography that these two guys were to be drug off of the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so it kept going, it was fine. So intermission <laughs> happened right after that and the company doctor came and checked us both out and he said, well, you're both okay, but you know, you could experience a little dizziness. So just be careful in the second act. But I advise you do not do the show tonight because you could be dizzy and fall and hurt a lot of people and yourselves. Hmm. That's the show Norman Jewison came to see. I wasn't there. I didn't know, you know, the show happened. Next day I get a call from the agent, Ted, Norman came to see you last night and he said, you weren't even there. What happened? So I explained all of this. I, he said, I said, well, it, it, what, what, can you do me another favor? He said, What's that? I said, I have a show this evening, but is it possible that I could maybe get Norman to have lunch with me in his somewhere in his hotel or something? You know, he said, well, the bottom line is, he and his wife are leaving tonight to go back to London. Uh, I'll call him and see if he's interested. He said, hold on. I held on. Two minutes later, he came back and he said, Norman said, please come to the hotel for lunch. He'd love to talk to you. Okay, so here I am. Now, this is all to set up regarding the beard and the mustache. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I, I was so excited that I was going to now get to meet Norman Jewess. <laughs> and I get off the phone and I glanced in the mirror and I go, uh-oh. I was trying to be 17 year old Tommy, you know, I short, shorter hair and nothing on my face just trying to look like a teenager, you know, <laughs> I thought this is not going to work. <laughs> okay, So I have a dear friend, actor, Martin Spear, he's my, been my buddy forever. I called him instantly and I said, Marty, I got a meeting with Norman Jewison for lunch. Can you come over here and make me look like Jesus? He said, yeah, I'll be over. <laughs> I figured, what have I got to lose, right? So, so he came with a wig, you know, and he put on a beard and all this thing. I, and I felt very comfortable thinking it might simulate Jesus. I didn't know that he'd cast people or whatever. So I go to the hotel and they said, don't bother the, the, the lobby or any of that. Just come up to his room and knock on the door. Great. So I go up to the room and knock, knock, knock. Nothing, not a sound. And I instantly, like you just looked, I went, huh? Yeah. I knocked again, nothing. I thought, ah, this is a great director's way of politely getting rid of somebody that's getting in his face, right? But then the Boy Scout thing, be prepared. Yeah. Also said, third time's a charm. So I went, okay, third knock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who is it? From the inside. I said, uh, it's the guy who wasn't there last night. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, we're supposed to have lunch. Just go down to, that's the way he sounded when he talked. Just go down to the restaurant there, and I'll be down in a few minutes, no problem. And I'm going, I am the luckiest man in the world. So go down to the restaurant. Oh, he, oh and he said, uh, get, get some coffee for me, will you? And I said, sure, boom. I'm not a coffee drinker, but I ordered coffee. I sat there for almost a half an hour, drinking coffee. <laughs> I drank almost a pot of coffee because I was so scared, you know. Ooh, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, he's given me the runoff. So I'll just have to accept that and move on. So I got up and went to the cash register to pay for my check. And all of a sudden I feel, there's Norman right there. And you know what he said? He said, bet you thought I wasn't going to show up, right? And I laughed. He said, you didn't show up last night. Why should I show up here for lunch? You know, so it was jokes and comedy the whole time for an hour, back and forth, back and forth. And that's when he let me know he had cast all the principles. But he said, after this meeting, I tell you, I, I had a good time and I like your humor and I, I'll keep in, in touch and I'll, 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 you'll be hearing from me. No problem at all. He said, but I really have to go. My wife and I are packing up to get catch the plane. So I walked out of there feeling like I had accomplished a lifetime challenge, you know, yeah, just yeah. Having the whatever to get together with this man with no agent or no manager or any of that stuff, you know, so it, it worked. So then we do Tommy. Okay. And we finish Tommy. And then immediately after we finished Tommy in LA, 
they decided to do the first American national tour of Superstar from the Broadway show. Now, this is in 1971. Mm -hmm. So now we're at the Universal Amphitheater. They, uh, what they did was they built that amphitheater for this show before Superstar opened. It was just an open field where they had a, a flatbed truck and did a Western show, you know, for the people who go on the Universal tour and see all this stuff. So they got rid of that, built this 5,500 seat amphitheater called the Universal Studios Amphitheater right there. And that's where we did the show. So we're rehearsing for that. <laughs> So one night, around three o'clock in the morning, my phone rang. I thought that's strange, but I answered, yeah, hello. And the voice said, Ted? I said, yeah. He said, Norman. Now, one of my closest friends growing up was Norman Glenn Carroll. I thought that was normal. That Norman called me. So I'm starting to talk about Ranger. How's it going? How, how's Bill going? And what's going on with Bob's service station? He said, he said excuse me, Ted. <laughs> you got me mixed up with somebody else. This is Norman Jewison. So I, once I picked myself up off the floor, it was Norman yeah. Jewison on the phone. I tried to sound like a gentleman and talk real. And he said, well, I just wanted to let you know that uh, since we talked, I've been here in London casting for dancers and singers and so on and talking to producers and so on and he said there's some people that have said to me that I need to see you sing a song or two uh, so uh, I'm going to be uh, in LA and uh, I know you're at the amphitheater doing the show and so I'll be I'll come see it and uh, we can talk some more so, so whoever that was that talked to him convinced him that he at least needed to look at this guy. You know, they knew something about what I had done and so on. Talking about the notes and all that you were saying, you see. So we do the rehearsals and then we get the show opened and it's, gosh, it's, it was a wonderful experience. The, op the first thing ever to be performed at the Universal Amphitheater, you know, and God, crowds came ugh, packed because of the superstar, the show live. Oh boy. And so <laughs> Norman said he was going to come and see the show. So we're, shall we say, a week before opening. And <laughs> I get a call from Norman saying, well, Ted, I've decided I'm going to give you a screen test because those same people are pushing me to just give you a shot, see what happens. He said, so uh, I'll do that within the next week. He said, but please don't say anything to anyone because uh, I have to make the arrangement to get into the studio there at Universal and find a spot. So it's easy for you to come from rehearsal next door. You know, that's what I assume would happen. Lunchtime, I'll go over to that place and sing a song and come back and finish rehearsal. <laughs> so, okay. Now we're a week before the, the opening of the show. And again, Three o'clock in the morning, one the next week, that same week, excuse me, that call came in. Norman, <laughs> Ted, it's Norman, you know, Jewish and Norman. <laughs> he said, it's, I'm not going to be able to make it to LA. So I'm going to have to bring you over here for the screen test. I said, and where's over here? He said, well, we're in London at Pinewood Studios. And I'm doing like you. I'm going, oh, what? I'd never been there, you know. <laughs> He said, okay, he said, but don't say anything to anybody because I have to make the arrangements with the, with the company people there to let you get out of the show if you have to miss a couple of shows or something. Okay, okay, okay. So back to rehearsal. Now I've got that powerful thing pushing me for rehearsal that I'm so excited that I'm going to do this. Yes. So he called and so he said, okay, I've got it set up. He said, uh, uh, I still haven't worked out yet the... Uh, the exact schedule how long it'll be but uh, again don't say anything to anyone until we talk and I said so let me get this straight sir you're, you're bringing me all the way to London to screen test me for your film uh, what particular song should I try to sing uh, for the character and he said well I think you should learn I don't know how to love him that was his humor, okay? He said, oh, I want you to play Mary Magdalene. You know? yes. That's what he said right back at me. <laughs> he said, no, I definitely want you to do Gethsemane. I want, they tell me, I got to hear you sing Gethsemane. Okay, okay. I said, so uh, another question, please. Um, 
I, I, will I do anything other than Gethsemane? He said, yeah, I'm going to have you do something with uh, Judas. You know, the, 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 the last supper scene where Jesus and Judas are face to face. Or I said, well, uh, do you have someone there that plays Judas that I'll be able to do it with? He said, yeah, but what's your thought? I said, well, there's a man right here that's the best of the best that we do this show together. And if it would be possible at all, he said, what's his name? I said, Carl Anderson. He said, yeah, they've talked about him too. He said, I'll bring you both over, no problem. So he took us over while we're doing the rehearsal thing, took us over. Did the screen test. He had me do, had Carl do Heaven on Their Minds. He had me do Gethsemane. And then we were ready to go. The, and the crew were applauding for us yeah, while they were shooting it. And it was just a piano player and us, you know. <laughs> so as we finished those two moments, he then said, I'll tell you what, fellas, you know that scene in the Last Supper sequence where Judas and Jesus just go face to face with each other and have the argument and the screaming and all that. He said, Do you, are you familiar with that? And we said, yes, sir, we, we, we know that. And we were rehearsing it right at the time. So we were ready. He yeah. said, he said, well, I'd like to see you do that too. So I did get, I, I, Carl did Heaven on Their Minds. I did Gethsemane and then the piano player starts to the riff and we do our thing. Everybody went nuts when we finished the, the, the crew. <laughs> just you go oh my god anyway he said guys thank you you did a beautiful job i'll keep in touch and we get on we go back get on the plane and fly back to la opening night happens and the night before opening night i get that three o'clock in the morning call again ted how are you how's the show going you know you guys having a good time yeah he said, I just want to thank you and Carl personally for coming all the way over here and doing that screen test for us. We just loved everything about it. And he said, you know what I think? No, sir. I'm sorry. What? He said, well, you are my Jesus. And again, I had to pick myself up off the floor I, because he had told me I already cast all my principles and I took a deep breath and said, well, may I ask you one question, sir? I, I, first of all, I can't believe this, but may I ask who, if I'm your Jesus, who is your Judas? He said, well, of course it's Carl. He said, that screen test the two of you guys did, I couldn't have directed it any better than myself. He said, just, you did, you, you, you both have the essence of the characters that I see in this film. So I want you to be in my film. Then, but you can't tell anybody, he said. Because I've got to take you out of the show because the show is you know, going to be in the summer, feel the full summer. And he was getting ready to go do the film. He wanted to bring us to, to London to do all the pre-recording of the soundtrack and then go directly to Israel to shoot the film. So he had to get us out of it. Whew. So he said, you can't tell anybody, Ted, until I let the world know that uh, what I'm doing, because I've got to get you out of this show and not break the contract or ruin the show, make sure they're covered and then get you over here. Okay, so that was the night before opening night of the show. And we're always rehearsing until opening night happens, you see. So um, next morning I go into the studio, <laughs> which is a big sound stage at Universal. Cast is all in there. And it just happened that Carl and I entered the room almost the same time from different sides of the room. I came in this door over here, he came in that door over there and we saw each other and the cast is there normally. And we literally ran across the floor and did one of those, ah, I can't believe this. And everybody's going, what's wrong with them? We just saw each other yesterday. <laughs> we couldn't tell anybody, we couldn't. So, but anyway, Opening night happened and it was just magnificent. Mm. And so many people came up because it was an outdoor amphitheater and they'd come up to the stage at the end of the show to talk to us and hug us and all that. So Carl and I were there till well after midnight talking to people on the stage. And, but, and the party was going on backstage in this big place. So when he and I get to the party, everybody cheers us and all that because they just thought, loved the show. And we were all doing the company hugs because opening night was great and all that. Well, we didn't know, but there was a photographer there 
shooting photographs of pretty much every move everybody made. And then suddenly I get a, a copy of a photograph. The photographer came over a couple of weeks later and said, I think you might like this. It was a picture of Carl and myself at that opening night party as close to a hug as possible having a conversation you know just laughing our faces off as we got this we're going to be in this movie just but we couldn't tell anybody because they hadn't arranged it they didn't know why we suddenly got to be so much more affectionate than normal oh i see they're changing their lives aren't they look at those guys <laughs> wonder if this is really what happened with judas and jesus oh <laughs> So, and the reason I've mentioned the photograph, yeah. I have an album that it's called Rock Opera. Yeah. That uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it or not, but it's uh, if not, let me know. I'll get you one. Uh, the bottom line with that is, we decided to put that photograph inside the album sleeve. Oh. Okay. So when you take the the CD off. There's Carl and Ted right under there going, oh, you know, and people go nuts when they open up that CD and see that, you know. Did that come out after he passed away or before him? No, it, it was before Carl oh, passed away. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, oh, the reason I do this is like I told you to begin with, I can't tell the short story. Everything, oh. so many chapters and so many, this happened and made that happen. And because of that, this over here happened. And that's the story of my life. I've never had any sort of guidance of what to or not to do other than my family growing up purpose in my hometown, you see. And I, I, I got into hair even by accident. I did hair, Tommy, Superstar and Sergeant Pepper, all four of those rock operas. And three of them were directed by the same man, Tom O'Horgan. Yeah. And Tom O'Horgan happened to see my band playing in a nightclub in LA long before any of this happened. So <laughs> it just, you go, how does, how does it work like that? I, if, we, if we hadn't have gone to Los Angeles, I never would have seen that Tom O'Horgan guy. And I, who knows what ever would have maybe happened for my band, you know? So somebody has been helping, as you asked early on, since the beginning, guiding this. And the thing that was most, shall we say, surprising for me that happened by accident or by nothing planned was when we got to LA and got to be so successful and we were ready to make the next move, hopefully to get into making records and stuff like that, you know, because we were being invited to, to the homes of all these magnificently famous Beverly Hills actors, you know, that, to play parties in their gigantic football field backyards, you know, and it, it just, and then we saw they invited us to start playing in all the private clubs in Beverly Hills, you know, it just, it, because we were different. It was during the time of surfer music, you know, the Beach Boys, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 go man, go, oh, oh, you know, uh, and uh, you know, <laughs> my God. But we were doing everybody else's music plus stuff from Texas, and so we were different. Yeah, so they came to see us, and and we were invited to play these Beverly Hills nightclubs, and then the Beverly Hills backyards and in one of those beverly hills backyard parties that we were the band playing and it was packed with all of these actors and actresses and recognized almost everybody who was there you know and one of the things we did ah uh, my god these memories are going all over me man it's I just it. i love it keep them coming the, the, one of them we did was at anthony franciosa's home in his backyard giant backyard it looked honestly looked like a, a small football field with a swimming pool and all that and they had it decorated so elegantly for all of their friends and it was like being you know in a nightclub because it was so packed with so many of their friends and he had built a platform up above everybody so we could stand on that to play the music and there was a tree over to the right a gigantic oak tree with a, you know this kind of a trunk on it and there was this guy leaning up against the tree having a drink throughout the whole night watching us and of course you can imagine what we were thinking that it was somebody who was picking whichever one of us he was going to invite home with him after the show you know 
Yeah, how Texans think is weird, you know. <laughs> Turned out he was the president of Capitol Records. Oh my gosh. We signed a record deal with Capitol the next week because he came to the backyard party. I, so think about that. One thing made something else happen, made something else happen, made it, it, and the next thing you know, we're gonna have an album coming out one of these days. And it did come out. <laughs> the band then was called the Teddy Neal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've seen some of your stuff on the Smothers Brothers. And Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I've watched. That's great, man. Yeah. <laughs> now, we didn't come up with that name. Who came up with it? We were playing in LA, excuse me, in Las Vegas at yeah. the Pussycat A Go Go. And uh, at, on one of our breaks, I went up to the bar to get some water because I always keep some water next to me. You know, and and, 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 and got to go to this, yeah, because I got to sing, keep the throat going. Yeah. So I went up to the bar to, to refill my bottle of water. And uh, this guy said, pardon me, uh, Ted, I've been watching the band. You guys are really great. He said, you ever been to Hawaii? And I said, no. He said, well, I have a nightclub over there. Would you like to come over and play in my club? <laughs> we, I said, are you kidding me? Of course, we'd like to go over there. So anyway, so when we go to Hawaii to get in this club, we go downtown to the, the, to the, the nightclub to, and on the marquee, it says, coming soon, the Teddy Neely Five. We were, did, called, we were called the Spirals. How did when, the band take that? Uh, we, hey, we, they were fine. Okay. It was us. What yeah. the heck? We thought, well, let's do this here. Well, that was another one of those things. We were supposed to be there for a month. We were there for three years, come straight through in that nightclub, right in the area where everybody parties in Honolulu, Waikiki, downtown. Hollywood Boulevard. I mean, whatever boulevard that was, it wasn't Hollywood. Sorry. <laughs> so it was amazing that we became the Teddy Neely Five. And so when we finished that long run and came back to home in California by that time, that's who we were. That's what they called us from that point on. And the guys were fine with it, you know. And just like everybody else I ever worked with, they were open to anything everybody got a chance to it wasn't me out front doing my stuff you know everybody yeah. was singing i'm banging away <laughs> like the eagles in other words you know the guy was singing playing yeah. drums yeah, yeah. You know? now now with the eagles don henley as the drummer right he yes. sang were you yes. were you drumming and singing at any point or were you always a lead singer no I, I, we all we all sang i i was the drummer for the band you know, just like the Eagles, the, everybody in our band sang, not just me. I was one of the singers of that band, and I'm back there on the drums. And the guys are up front doing, we had two guitars, bass, and drums. That was it, you know, just like the, the Beatles. The clip I saw from the Smothers Brothers, or I think it was, but anyways, you were out front singing. Oh, like, yeah. By that time, we had, <laughs> the, when I told you about the thing in Vegas where the guy from Hawaii came and said, you want to go play? Well, in that same nightclub, that same week, at one of those breaks when I was a guy come up, came up and said, you know what? You should be out front. You should have a drummer. You should get a drummer and you should be out in front of the band. I said, great. Do you know anybody? He said, yeah, me, I'm a drummer. <sighs> Next day we went over to his house in the daytime. He just blew us all away. He moved into the band. I moved out front. He, he made circles around me, you know, I just started playing because I wanted to. He was a real professional drummer, you know. So, and uh, the one that when you're talking about, that's the guy. Yeah. Paul Tabbitt was his name. He's from Philadelphia area. And uh, he's great. Absolutely incredible. And the rest of the guys were the guys that I grew up with in school, you know. Well, you know, that's, you've just talked about, all, again, I call this coincidental conversations. You just yeah. talked about all those coincidences. Yes. And I think about the coincidences like in the documentary and the movie with, well, just like how you got the roles, <laughs> the, uh, the shepherd behind the cross. Wait, ah, you and, really are observant. Man. And the, the other one that I just heard, well, I don't know if it was in a different, but the scaffolding, uh -huh. you know, that that became part of the movie. We, when we got, that was the, the ruins of Herod the Great's palace. And, and 
they made Norman went to Israel several months before he put this thing together just to scout the locations because he wanted to make sure he had as much authenticity as possible. Everything in the film that you saw that were sets was just there. The only thing that our company built was the moat for the King Herod song, and they put that on the Dead Sea. The other thing they did that they had to change was when they found the Garden of Gethsemane with all those magnificent trees and the beauty of that, mm -hmm. there was no grass. It was all just sand and stone, you know? So Norman sent a, a bunch of the crew over a month or so ahead of time to plant the grass, you see? <laughs> so we could have a beautiful green garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> so, but what I'm saying, it was all real, all there. So when we got to Herod the Great's palace and we walked in, they, the people who manage all of that historical stuff in Israel had decided to, to make Norman Jewison happy. And so they had a crew there that was gonna disassemble the scaffolding so we wouldn't have to see that. And Norman, the minute he saw it, he and they came up to him and said, Mr. Jewison, we'll gladly take that down if you wish. He said, don't change a thing. I know exactly what I can do with that. Cause he immediately thought about, I'll put the priests up there. And then how, how could it be more perfect in the way that worked out? He was, he was really brilliant, huh? Brilliant, like a visionary, right? I, you used exactly the word that we all use when we say Norman, we say the visionary Norman Jewison. Because you know, he he heard the music, the original Brown album, mm -hmm. while he was uh, shooting Fiddler on the Roof. Mm -hmm. And he he says he well in the documentary he mentioned about he he stayed up all night and listened to the music and he fell in love with the music and blah, 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 blah. Well, while he was in making Fiddler on the Roof, Barry Denon was also in Fiddler on the Roof, you see? And he goes to Barry one day and says, you know, that album you're on, that superstar, it's really a good album. He said, do you, uh, you have any connection with uh, Tim or Andrew about that? And, and Barry says, of course, I know them very well. Anyway, he put Norman in touch with him. They called and talked and he did all of his things with Tim and Andrew, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so the point was that he was in the process while he was doing Fiddler on the Roof of thinking about doing the screenplay for it. And he got the okay from Tim Rice to say, use all of his lyrics as the storyline and just adapt visuals to match what the lyrics were saying. And that's why he spent so much time ahead of time there searching locations to match what Tim said because Tim wrote the story with the lyrics. Norman just wrote the screenplay adaptation to visualize, if you will, what Tim had to say, you see. And no spoken dialogue. It was all songs, no spoken dialogue. No, no dialogue at all, it, nothing. It's an opera, you know? And this was the first rock opera ever to be made into a film. And it was because Norman Jewison fell in love with that original Brown album, which we as a company refer to as the Brown Bible. Mm. literally because he went into the first four books of the, uh, for, uh, of the new testament mostly uh, mark and john to get all of his ideas for the songs you see oh. so the essence was the bible gave him the concept for the lyrics and the lyrics gave norman the concept for the visual you know it's i, I don't know if you're a fan of uh, hamilton oh well i've not seen it but i know so much about it i, I yeah I've, I've never had a chance yet to see it Ted, as soon as this pandemic is done, you have to see that. Oh, well, no question. You, yeah. you would, because it, it, I know it would resonate with you. You know, no question. And it, it reminded me just in watching it and in hearing about how uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda wrote it from the book. Um, it reminded me a lot of Superstar. Hmm. The, the the heart of it felt as I was watching it felt very much like Superstar to me. Oh. You know, now, I have seen the the film that he put out, you know, that uh, it was recently on TV. Yeah, and, oh, I was blown away by everything about it, everything. Yeah. And here's another irony of what happened as a result of this other thing happening. You know, he won all those awards for that. For, and of course, he was playing the, the principal character. <laughs> And when he got his award, they, they always go backstage afterwards and they're introducing and talking to the to the, the awards people, you know, newspaper and film and everybody there. And they interviewed him and they said, well, wow. He said, 
you've been doing this for X amount of time, whatever it was, he'd been playing the role and then he wins because he created it and then he plays the role and he wins that. And they ask him, how do you feel about the fact that this is so successful? Do you, do you have plans on maybe doing it for quite a while? And they said, he took a breath for a minute and then he said, well, if I can, best example I can give you is I hope this production will give me the same opportunity as Ted Neely in Jesus Christ Superstar. Coincidence? <laughs> there we go. And then whenever it was on TV, we watched it, you know, and I had my daughter take photographs of me sitting here watching it because uh, I was, I had a plan to send something to Lynn manuel Miranda. Yeah, yeah. I was magnificent. I loved everything about it, you see. And he responded. Oh, I can't believe you saw my show. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and that's the other question I had for you. You know, so many actors and, you know, they've, they're so worried about being typecast. You know, they, yeah. weren't, a, they weren't a big role or TV and they don't want to talk about it again. They're right. worried about not getting something different. Right. But you've, you've really embraced it. I mean, it's, you, you go completely opposite of that. So did you ever have a feeling, did you ever experience, hey, I don't want to do that anymore for a while? Or have you always embraced it? The way it, the way, it just like everything else with me, because I, I still, to this moment, am amazed that I got cast in that movie, that I got to do that, you see. And it changed my life completely in every possible way. And in case I get carried away and, and forget, just say, you were going to say something else about okay. how it changed your life, okay? Okay. And the fact is that once, I was blown away just being able to be in the Broadway show, even as an understudy to start well. And then when we started the, 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 the tour in LA, and I, Carl and I got to both be Jesus and Judas, and we were ready to go out and do that. Then we'd get, go, go to Israel and go in the film. You go, wow, the two understudies are doing this. It's, it's what is going on here? You know? Anyway, so what I'm saying is the, the whole thing about what you just said, it never entered my mind. Because again, I was never a person with agents and managers and whatever. Uh, certainly once uh, they, the industry found out that I was in Superstar, I had all kinds of agents coming to you know, assign me and all that. And mm -hmm. I, I never really got anything done with it because I, it wasn't an interest. I thought, well, I'm probably never doing anything else. But so when we finished the film, and I'm back in LA getting ready to now do an agency thing and maybe see if I can get other films, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I signed an agreement with an agency which shall remain unnamed because I can't blame them. It wasn't their fault, but I, I sat down on my seat for almost two years doing auditions for films and not getting any of them. Mm. Why? Because they all said, he's Jesus. They're going to think that's Jesus playing this character and they're not going to buy it. And I thought, what's wrong with that? <laughs> That's a credit, okay? You know? And if I'm allegedly able to act, you know, if I'm not in the Jesus costume, maybe I might look like, you know, any crook in the world that's doing weird stuff, you know? Anyway, so uh, I did not do anything of Superstar, nor did Carl, for 20 years. Oh. We did all kinds of other things, but we didn't do movies. We were doing our nightclub stuff and the band stuff, you know? And then he and I decided we wanted to do a 20th anniversary celebration of, since the movie was released, just to get everybody together, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I called nightclubs, I called theaters, and they all thought it was a good idea, but they thought, well, you know, it's been 20 years and nobody's really interested. That was basically the response. And I'm thinking, you have no idea how many people are interested, you know, so we should do it. So we were able to set up an arrangement with, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a beautiful theater in Baltimore, Maryland, that we had both worked in for various things, and they decided to give it a shot. So we had our 20th anniversary production of Jesus Christ Superstar in, in this Baltimore, Maryland place. And the idea was we needed the theater for a four-week rehearsal, and we wanted to do a six-week run if we could. They said, no problem. We'll advertise it. We'll make it happen. So the fact that we did that one production, celebrating 20 years of the film, so many people came to see it. As if it was like you said, it was just put out yesterday, right? And so many of those people 
were agents and producers. Mm. Well, when they saw the show in Baltimore, we got an offer from a company to do a national tour because they loved the production, you see? So we said, great, fantastic, boom, boom, boom. So in that six week period in that theater, because they came, we had this whole thing, Range Carl and I did, inviting all of the people who do uh, national tours in America to come at our expense. We will pay for your trip here. We will give you free tickets and we'd like to talk to you if you might be interested about doing this tour, okay? Businessmen, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> we thought. So we got it, we made a deal with a magnificent company and uh, that tour ran for six years. And that's the tour that I saw you on at, at uh, the Star Plaza Theater, right? <laughs> And we've been friends with those people, that production company, forever. In fact, I just got a call from them two weeks ago that they're going to, they, they're, they were in Cleveland at the time. That's where they're, they were housed. Now they're out in uh, Park City, Utah, <clears throat> next to Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. and, you know, living the high life because they've been producing shows ever since. And they're, they got a couple of bucks or two and, you know, and they're really good at what they do. They're the kind of people who, that as production people, they don't get involved in any way, shape or form on the artistic side. Mm, they take right. care of the production and yeah. get it advertised. They let us take care of the artistic side. Nice. This is great, just wonderful. Anyway, man's name's Lee Marshall, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, the, his company in Cleveland was Magic Entertainment. And uh, then when he moved out to Salt Lake City, they became Magic Arts and Entertainment because they, uh, started a company with a Salt Lake City company so that they combine their abilities and it's just great. They called me two weeks ago or sent a, excuse me, they sent an email to my daughter who handles all of that stuff for me saying, hi Peg, I, you know, we're, we're doing a, a new show here. We're gonna open and they're, they're opening it up in, in, uh, in June in Park City. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, but they're doing the show in Salt Lake City and they're opening the theaters. I don't know if it's half full or two people or whatever, but they said, I guess what we're going to do for our opening production. And I said, I have no idea. And they said, well, we're going to do the music of Andrew Lloyd Webber concerts, selections from all of the stuff. Nice. He's, you see? And we would love to have you come and sing Gethsemane, you know, so I'm thinking, well, and I told him, well, I got to tell you, I'm really paranoid about catching this pandemic you know and i want to make sure that everything's okay if i get out there and get sick then i won't be able to play with you guys anymore you know yeah, yeah. So they understood no problem at all so anyway my point is a relationship was made from that thing we did carl and i did that nobody else was interested in and we've met these people who have been my friends ever since for all these years and that was you know that was almost 30 years ago that 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 happened and we did things together we did we've done four american tours since then and they produced all of them you see so once again i said if it weren't for norman jewison there probably never would have been a film jesus christ superstar and all of these people i've met along the way if we hadn't done something together i wouldn't be working nor maybe would they so we have the relationship you go, hey let's do another one blah 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 it's just friends take care of friends and i know you know that and, and you said the magic word relationships. Oh boy! You wanted me to remind you. Ah uh, yes. Okay. That it back, changed it. You and another. About changing my life. Yes. Yes. Well, not only did the experience in Israel change my life, and all of us who were in it, it none of us to this day can still imagine why Norman chose us. <laughs> and and I ask him, literally, Carl and I had a lot of time with him on set, you know, and we were having lunch one day. Uh, on the set to the three of us and i just said well carl and i've been wondering about this since we made that trip to london for the screen test and we'd just love to know why you chose the two of us instead of those big name stars that you had planned on using he said you know what and he said i'm telling you both this from my heart because my initial plan was to have well-known people in all the all of the principal character roles because i didn't know if a rock opera could be successful on its own i felt i might need the quality and the advantage of well-known actors and singers to help that possible happen and he said once i saw the two of you do your your screenplay i mean excuse me your your screen test 
He said, I was blown away with what you did, but still nobody ever heard of either one of you. And so I, I thought, well, I got to do something to make this work. And he said, when we got to Israel, I got to thinking, you know, Norman, he's saying that to himself, you know, Norman, you made the right decision because this entire cast looks like the people who lived here 2000 years ago. Nobody knows them. So that means maybe they will think they look like and are the real characters. He said, because I thought, well, what if I had Paul Newman playing Jesus? He said, right. they'd be watching Paul Newman. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be watching Jesus. They'd be going, Paul Newman's doing a great Jesus. Man. You see? So I realized that it could come from just like Jesus was completely unknown. Everybody was unknown during that period of time. And they came on the scene and some magical things happened. I thought this is going to work because it's the first ever rock opera to be produced as a film. We have a cast of unknowns who are part of that. So it makes it a new element for the film industry. He said, that's why I chose you two to be in this movie. Plus, you did the best screen test of anybody that I had tested. Now, I want to be respectful of your time. Do you still have time for a few questions? or do hey, you... Don't worry about me. I'm here for you. I'm, oh, I'm cool. Because okay. <laughs> when I heard you wanted to do this, okay, I got one today. <laughs> well, well, that's <laughs> great. Afternoon, but, uh, uh, that's my wife. Just look in here. Just say, just wait. Yeah. And, say, and, look, and look, look at the t-shirt she's wearing. Hello. This is Leanne. How are you doing? Hi, this is how James. Are how are you? It's very nice to meet you. <laughs> without her and my daughter i wouldn't be able to do any of this so and leanne was in the film right that's right we met while we yeah. were making the film what a gift think about that what a blessing huh oh. he's very lucky. well you know <laughs> you <hear what> she <laughs> he's very lucky <laughs> uh, so she grew up in the national ballet of canada in toronto she's a, a, a classic ballerina ballet dancer you yeah. see i as i told you grew up in that tiny texas town what are the chances that a classic ballet dancer from toronto and the path of a texas weirdo are ever going to cross in israel we met each other wow. and she's still putting up with me after all this time <laughs> she makes me wear the robe every once in a while just for memories you know <laughs> you know i think that's why i wanted to ask you in the i can't remember if it's in the documentary or somewhere else you talked about we talked about you talked about tears mm -hmm. you know, how many tears there are with the cast with the fans mm -hmm. and you said you cry every time you do get said me that's right and i, I wanted to ask part. you what is what's causing those tears and who are you talking to in get set of me it's okay if i cry now <laughs> of course yeah i i have i do every time i watch the the music i get so, emo <clears throat> I get so emo <clears throat> emotional when i talk about this because it's truth uh i had such a close relationship excuse me i just got to take a quick drink here sorry of course yeah I had such a magnificent experience in my childhood with my family, my mom, my dad, my older brother, Jack, my younger sister, Peggy, uh, my dad, Ray, my mom, Zola. Oh, I don't know. It was to me, it was family, mm -hmm. but to people that I've met since who some say their family relationship was terrible and they wanted to run out. I, I could not spend enough time with anybody in my family. My dad was a fisherman. He worked in the oil fields in Texas. My mother was born and raised in Texas. They all had close dear friends. My dad and his brother came to Texas from El Southern Illinois for the, the oil boom when that happened in Texas. And they were working in this even tinier town where the oil wells were closest to us. And I, he would drive to that little town every day to do his work and we'd go fishing because it was a, it was a farm town and there were, there were, there were uh, built ponds for the, you know, the horses and the cattle and people to drink from. So there were fish, they put fish in all the ponds. So we went fishing every day. You know, we always had fresh fish at, at night when we got home, mom was there doing the thing, you know, my older brother, Jack, four years my age, um, brilliant trumpet player, 
jazz trumpet player. He had his own jazz band in Ranger as well. Um, and I was following in his footsteps originally, footsteps, uh, and I decided to pick up the trumpet and try to do what he was doing. And But I just didn't have the embouchure that he did, you know. <laughs> That's why I decided I can do this, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, everything that I did was close. The family was always there and supportive of everything we wanted to do, no matter what we wanted to do. So what you're talking about was I, I had a, a joyful, tearful childhood. Tears always came from joy, from happiness, from surprises and, you know, just emotion. With this, it comes from the essence of what it represents. That little town was very biblical. So, you know, you couldn't grow up in that town without going to church and go to church every Sunday. In fact, I, the first time I sang in public was in the church choir, you know, so it's been part of my life, you know, knowing biblical stories. And when I told this to Norman Jewish and he said, that's why you got it. Cause you were researching this from the time you were a kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. thank you. She's so helpful. Don't let me forget this. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the tear thing is something that was just natural and the hugging thing it was family and my dad's brother was in the, that little town called Strawn, texas uh, which was where all the oil wells were and his family was even larger than ours and much older i had cousins that were parents of grandchildren already when i was a little boy you know so my dad was much younger than his older brother they both worked together yeah. So, oh, everything was just beautiful. Like you see movies about families that are just one. And well, that was our family. And crying was something that was just as natural as smiling, you know. <laughs> so getting into this character and into this music, I tell you, I can't walk on the stage. Sometimes I, I don't feel my feet ever touch the ground. It, it, the minute the music starts, there's an uplift just... No matter how you feel, it's just suddenly your, your body is filled with this positive, loving energy. And then what happens? The audience starts applauding and responding and you can hear them singing along with you in the front row. And whew, it is a magnificent spiritual experience, celebration every time we do it. And imagine what it felt like in Europe when we're in those 10,000 seat arenas with people singing along and shouting along. and. Oh, so it's been that way all my life from 1971 until well this year i've been sitting not working because we can't but up until last february when we were doing our last uh, screenings because we do those i haven't told you about those all the time i've been unemployed as they say so it is something that has held me together with all of these cast members musicians People who came in and say, understudied someone because they were out sick and then I didn't see him for 10 years. And then we still have a relationship because we were working on stage in this show. And I know you saw Barry Denon's interview in the screener. All, you heard what everybody had to say. They, they're the same way as I am about this experience. Yeah, and, and that song particularly. Gethsemane. Gethsemane. Can you kind of walk, can you walk me through what's happening in that song? Like, it, it, it really feels like a transformation, that song. Well, you'll have to walk with me right now, so get ready. <laughs> I <sad>. am. <laughs> hold your hand and you have to sing too, you know. All right. <laughs> I told you I'm a musician, so. <laughs> the thing, the great thing about it is the placement of where it actually is in the show. Hmm. It's not the first song, you know. Right. The, the pressure was always on Carl, you know, to come out and go heaven on their minds is the opening song, you see. But the overture prepared all of us for the first song, you see. And Carl, oh, oh here it goes. <laughs> well, what a, what a power, my God, what a powerful voice. Oh, wow. I've heard so many people attempt that song. Uh -huh. And they're all good. Yeah. The closest, are you, are you familiar with an American singer called, named Corey Glover? The name sounds, yeah, really familiar, yeah. Well, he did uh, one of our tours, and he's the closest anybody has come to Carl's interpretation. 
And that's because he was a big fan of Carl's and saw the movie many times and all that. And then I get to Italy and one of the Italian actors who played Judas was the second closest to Carl because he too worshiped Carl Anderson and he was so honored to be able to play that role. So what I'm saying is this music does something to the spirit. Mm -hmm. the, the lyrics alone, if you just sit down and talk the lyrics and we do that when we rehearse just to make sure everybody knows the lyrics properly, mm -hmm. that makes us cry when we're rehearsing, mm -hmm. see? And then when the music comes in, what, what Tim Rice did with those lyrics to tell the entire story with songs, Andrew Lloyd Webber then put the icing on that cake mm -hmm. with the melodies of those songs. When you think about what? Help. that just made the skin crawl, okay? <laughs> and I've heard it thousands of times. Mm -hmm. And then how about Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I'm crawling with it. So that melody works without the lyrics. Oh. It's the closing thing for the for the, the crucifixion. Uh, with, it, with the London Philharmonic Symphony Orchestra playing it in the film soundtrack. So no matter where we are in a performance, no matter how many we've done that week or that year or that whatever, it's brand new. It never gets old. It, it, it nourishes your emotional experience on the stage. And then when you're getting eye to eye, face to face with the people you're performing with and the emotions come out of them to match yours, then that's twice the emotional experience for every song that's done. And the dancers, the choreography in this show has always been brilliant, no matter where we've done it. So those moments when I'm not singing I'm, and I'm out there on the stage, like the Simon song, for example, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh. I, I'm being pumped from every side because I'm surrounded by all this magnificent song, you know, it's just and dance and it's just, there's no way to get bored. It will not allow you to get bored. And I think what gets said to me, why that always hit me was I felt along, I was feeling along with the empathy, you know, empathizing with the anguish mm. of Jesus, not only had his, you know, had his friends, they'd fallen asleep, but he was scared, right? Yes. He didn't want to do this. It's like, let me, I want out. That's right. Why should I die? Right. Why? I'm accomplishing what you asked me to. Yeah. Why should you kill me? Why? Why? Yeah. What did I do? You know? How would you feel if you were talking to your father? Yeah. You found out that your father said, I'm going to have you killed. Mm. Be prepared. And the advantage of that for me is... My father passed years ago. So I have, I'm talking to my father when I'm mm -hmm. singing the song. If I had no belief in, in spirituality or religious faith at all, if there were no God, I have my father to talk to, you see? And in the character, I'm pretending as an actor to talk to God. I'm talking to God through my father. Mm -hmm. oh, because my father would never have done anything to kill me. Why? So that adds the element of why must I die? Tell me why. Ah! And then, uh, okay, now I understand. So I'll, I'll die. But tell me before I change my mind. Mm -hmm. Take me before I change. Listen to those lyrics. Yeah. Take me now before yeah. I change my mind. <laughs> it's like I'm starting to get a little. Oh, yes, yes. Imagine doing that while you're singing, you know? Oh, so I don't have to pretend anything with this show. And that's why I have always loved everything about doing it. No matter, I've done it thousands and thousands of times. And I can't wait to get on stage and do it again. Have, have you found that playing the role has changed you just personally? Like- Absolutely. As a, as a man, like- oh. Excuse me, just don't forget that. Sweetheart, yeah. do me a favor, please. 
call Frank and tell him to let the guy know that I'm going to be a bit late. Okay. Do you need to go, Ted? I have another interview, but it's it's the last one for the day, so it's not a problem. And okay. I, I can't tell you what this means to me, the way you are doing this. this is, it's the first time I've ever had this opportunity with a journalist to, to talk like this, because you're so emotionally moved by it. It's always been respectful, but you you should be in the cast, man. <laughs> I would, I, which, which role would you want to do? You're a musician, I'll, you're a singer? Oh, anything. I Just to be in that... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm a singer and I play and uh, punches or who, anything. Oh, I don't that know. would be great. You would be great for pilot. But I would love an it. emotional element, man. Ah. Okay, you, now you were in the middle of a question. I'm sorry. So, that's okay. So playing this role, have you found that it's changed you as a man? Like, do you find yourself closer to Jesus? Or yeah, I don't want to get too religious, but it's a that's religious okay. experience. That's right. How, how would it be possible for anyone to be pretending to represent, if you will, the essence of Jesus Christ for as long as I have, right. not, not understand something about, and I was already a, a Christian as a child, you see, believer, absolute, going to church every Sunday and singing in the choir and all that. And, and it got to a point in my hometown, literally, when any children would be in Sunday school and have trouble with maybe understanding the way that the person was teaching the Sunday morning class to the grade school kids or whatever, they would invite me to talk to them. And this was before any of this superstar thing because my parents were wonderful and guide and, and everybody that I knew were honest and about their feelings and nobody condemned anybody if they didn't believe it was okay, but we're here to make sure everybody's happy. So what I'm saying is, Everything that I've had the opportunity of doing in this show, the productions that I've been in for so many years, no matter where they are, each time there's a new element, a new level of that emotional, spiritual essence that lifts me. It literally lifts my spirit, no matter where we go. And the example is when we were in, excuse me, in uh, Rome, for all that time, we were there for the six week run and then he decided to go to other cities and then to other countries and all that. Oh. There are people in almost every city that we have been in Europe that have come to see the production of the, the, the Italian production of Superstar over a hundred times. And they always get front row seats or the first five row seats and they're singing along. And especially in Rome, this group of people started what they call the circle turning. And they started that because <laughs> in interviews, they heard me say, how is it that you're able to reach this level of emotional experience in every performance? And I learned a long time ago with audiences, we, we get in the theater and we get ourselves ready to go and the theater's quiet, you know, nobody's there. And then about, maybe 15 to 20 minutes before the show starts, they open the doors for people to come in. And we can hear the people coming in. We can't hear what they're saying, but an empty audience is silent. The minute the people start, you hear the, and then it's closer it gets to the performance, it's louder. And then it's, it's like a football field. You hear all these people. And once we're getting up on the stage, the, the curtains are, are always, already up when, when we're getting ready to come on so they get to see the band coming on stage and setting stuff up and all that well we're backstage getting into our position and we can see them as well but they can't see us you see and, it, and you see people standing up and touching each other and giving each other something or they're embracing each other blah 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 so they were asking me in interviews how was it that i was able to get to those moments each night and honestly what happened was when you start out in a room that's absolutely silent, a half hour later, it's packed full and you hear all of the audience doing what the audience is doing. And then all of a sudden, the lights in the house start to go down, start to dim. When the lights start to dim, it gradually gets down to absolute silence again, mm -hmm. nothing. And then the first thing you hear is fear. You know that? Okay. And you can, you can see the audience going. 
you know, you're going, okay, they're ready. Then, <laughs> and that happens, and you can see the audience is rocking in the band. The, the, the dancers are on stage doing the choreography, and it goes through the whole overture, and then it goes that through that whole thing. And the way they did it in Rome was I actually entered the stage from the floor on a riser. Oh, dead center, oh, rising up. Powerful. And the audience goes, Whoa! right now, the chills on me. By the time I just walk on the stage, I feel like I'm the real guy because of what they are doing. Yeah, yeah. It, I don't know what I did as a child to deserve this, but whatever it was, i doing the best I can to teach our children the experience of my growing up so they can know that we all have opportunities if we just do the best we can to be prepared for whatever happens and go with what happens and accept it and move on, you know? Well, I'm gonna, I'll tell you this and I'm gonna let you go because I wanna be really respectful of your time. Oh, thank you. you Cause you said you don't know what you've ever done. I don't think it's necessarily what you've done. I think it's who you are. Um, when my, Right before my mom passed away, she told me something. She said, I love you for who you are, not what you've done. Yeah. Yeah. And just to finish this off, you, you said you wanted to meet Norman Jewison because you admired his work. Yes. That's how I felt about today. Oh. You know? <laughs> and, and I think I finally get it. I think I, got, I think I figured out the secret to why so many people love this show love what you do for so long. And why I loved it as a kid is because it feels like home. Oh. When I heard Gisetomy as a kid, something about it felt like home to me and safe. And there's, so that's what's happening there. So thank you. Um, I will be writing um, for the Chicago Tribune, the blog, and I'll, I'll share this video and this blog with you um, I'm going to talk about the documentary, you know, coming out, you know, that it's available in April and that it's available also in August on DVD and Blu-ray and streaming. Um, so I just, you know, I just need to, I, I'll tell you this last coincidence. The first book I wrote is called, Where Are We Going it's So Fast? As well? Yeah. I, I, please send me a list of the books, please. please. I'll send you, I'll send you the book. I'll send you, if I, I'll, the, the name of the book is Where Are We Going So Fast? Finding the Sacred in Everyday Moments. Wow. And I've always heard you use the word epiphany. And I looked up epiphany and one of the definitions is sacred. Yes. So thank, I just wanted to thank you for doing this. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I look forward to you know continuing the conversation. And uh, th thank you for everything you've done. I, I, I want you to know how honored I am being able to speak with someone like you uh, regarding this project. It makes all the difference in the world, man. It just, it's like you've been with me in the show all this time. Is that that commonality of spirituality literally between us this magnificent and you just made me realize that i forgot to say something that i wanted to say to begin yeah. with about the screams that uh, screaming the streamings yeah you know, it, it's on it, it was originally set and we're amazed that we get to have the streamings because we didn't know if we were going to be able to meet the, the deadline for easter we wanted it to happen in easter but you know we're not a, a well-known film company so we had to pass certain things to get to this to that to this to that and suddenly this company said they would be more than happy to stream it for the easter holidays so from tonight through next monday it's streaming on a uh, vimeo is the mm -hmm. name of it. okay so they streamed it they started streaming it last night and they contacted my, my business manager Frank this morning and said we've never had this many people respond to something the first time it's been on okay so it was going to go just for for Friday through Monday yeah it's now going to go through the end of April because of what happened last night and that's Vimeo 
it's it's a normal you know right. regular screening thing where you go and you pay for your view or you can buy the the video the thing you're watching whatever it is they've decided to cover it for the whole month okay so we are, are amazed once again at the response and and i'm telling you they are so excited about it because of it is Easter and they wanted to have something new for Easter and by golly, here we've given them this and they loved the what they saw last night. So again, we are so fortunate and I must thank David James. Ah, the David James is our photographer. Yep. He was with us the entire time in Israel. He's a dear friend. He came up with so many photographs that we had never seen that mm. he took while we were on set, you know, shooting the, the film. Did he do and, the video too? The, 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 no, the video was done by Frank and myself and our I'm, buddy. You mean on the set though? No, no, what I mean is that there was someone like filming on your set in Israel. Oh, yeah. like I, no, that, that was him and his, his, oh. his photographic guys that did their things you know that, that was them he was the one guy and, and he's been doing those films ever since he's done so many major films all over the world for the last 40 plus years great guy and he's got a vault that looks like chicago it's that big <laughs> oh and i wanted to also let you know yeah. that, that when you saw the segment with barry Denon mm -hmm. in in our our documentary yeah. the music that was played in yeah. that he wrote that song. Who, it's who called did? a song, Barry Denon. It's called A Song With No Name, you see. And he, he never he never had anything released. He when, See, he his career started when he was in the West End of London. He was the star of, of uh, Cabaret, the original production right. of Cabaret. Right. Yeah, and he played the, the you know, the, the what do you call it? The, yeah. Cabaret, cabaret, cabaret. You know, he played that guy, okay? First guy. And because he was so successful in that show, that made Tim and Andrew go to talk to him to see if he might be interested in being on the original album, you see? And the original album is what made Norman Jewess and hire him as pilot. And again, same stuff over and over and over. So let me see if I've messed this up. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. This one really blew me away. Whenever we start looking at those photographs, David yeah. James. Yeah. Suddenly, there's this photograph. Whew. David's also from London. I didn't know him at all. But there's a photograph of me during the screen test, wearing a T-shirt, a tie-dyed, long-sleeved T-shirt that was given to me by Bob Bingham, who played Caiaphas, in New York for our opening night of the Broadway show, the original Broadway show. That was his gift to me for opening night. And I wore it for the screen test. It, David James had a copy of that in his because he was there when the screen tests were going on. See, say, it, what can I tell you? <laughs> it just never stops. It, it's great, right? Oh, oh. So I got, I got it all. Yeah, I got it. Oh, 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 and this is going to be just in America and Canada on Vimeo. Just because they don't go, they let us know today, as of the end of this week, in other words, the beginning of next week, it, they're going to start screening it, streaming it worldwide, not just in America and Canada. It goes back, Ted, to that it's striking a chord because it makes people, I think it makes people feel like home, but it's also coming out of this pandemic. It's, oh, yes. it's, re, it's rebirth, you know? Yes. So people, that's what people draws people to this. It's hope. This yes. is a, this is about hope, you know. So, and I swear you're you are now quoting Massimo Romeo Piparo, who is the producer director of the Italian production of Superstar that I've been in for the last five and a half years, minus this year. It would have been six and a half years by now. And uh, once we the pandemic hit, he said, Ted, I just want you to know when this is all cleared up and gone, I want to reopen with Superstar because mm. he says, I think people are going to need this to get back into some sort of natural feeling to be able to share the experience. And that's how he feels. So at least I know I have a job when this is over. <laughs> I think you're going to be OK. Anyway, thank you yeah. so much. I, you, and Ted. by the way, we do screenings all the time. You know, we, we, in fact, we were on one of our screening tours when the pandemic hit and we were in Florida and literally each theater we played in, 
the, the do the screenings of the movie. At the night we would do our screenings, the next night they closed the town down for the pandemic. And, and we literally were chased out of Florida to get back home, you know. And we had booked the whole year last year. And then we had to cancel them all. And part of what we had booked for Easter last year was the theater in a town called Chicago. Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> we've been in Chicago many times. Uh, it's the Hollywood Boulevard Cinema in uh, Woodbridge. Mm -hmm. Woodbridge. We've played that theater so many times and they are magnificent. And we already had it booked last year for, for Easter. And then there's another one in Boston that we've done that many times. So we were going to go to Boston first, the premiere, and then we were going to go to Chicago. Yvonne and I have put together a concert, an evening with Yvonne and Ted singing songs and telling stories. All of her hit records, our stuff from everything we've done yeah. together. A full, you know, night, like a Las Vegas show thing. And we were going to do the screenings one night and a concert another night, a screening another night, a concert in those cities, you see. Well, they're waiting for the pandemic to live so we can go right back there and do that. And we will be in Chicago, I swear we will. So please, let's, you and I keep in yes, touch. Definitely. I want to know everything about your book. I want to know all those things we've talked about, please. And I want us to keep in touch as friends because you're, you've been my friend for life. We just didn't know it. <laughs> You said you've watched it all your life. See? Thank you. <laughs> so uh, whenever we find out the schedules and all yep. that, I'll let you know about uh, Hollywood. Have you ever been to that cinema, Hollywood Boulevard Cinema? No, but I, I know where the where that's located. And I, I saw your, your uh, interview with Dean Richards on WGA. Yeah. yeah, well, the reason we go there was they called us and asked, you know, several years ago if we'd come and do our screenings. We've been, Frank and I have been doing these screenings now for eight years all over America. And Chicago is the best of all places we go. Boston is second to that. And then Cleveland comes down to that. And, it's, and they all want us to come back instantly, just like you said, to open up again. Yes. With the, so the screenings, we used to all be sing-alongs, but we're not going to sing along now for fear that the yeah. singing. Yeah. Be, uh, but it's a, it's a brand new digital remastering. Oh, I, 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 I want to say that. Beautiful. Yeah. It looks like it was made yesterday found everything brand new just whoa. so we're gonna be there so i'll definitely let okay. you know you know uh, when and you gotta come you gotta come and oh, i'm there <laughs> thank you Terry. Oh, <laughs> thank and, you so uh, much please thank your wife for me too you know for oh, letting me have you for these couple hours yeah. and thank benji too oh benji is the star but no question he runs this household he's, I know. Sitting, right he's sitting right here he's always pumped up right next to you you know He's doing his thing. <laughs> hey, Benji. Oh. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ted. I'll be, I'm sure we'll be I, talking. Actually, he's the Simon Zealots, you know. He's always <laughs> making people have a good time, you know. You know? <laughs> Thank you. All, All the right. best to your family. And I look forward to seeing you again soon, man. Same to you, Ted. You take care. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm going to go cry now. <laughs> uh.